Now I am going to make a uh, announcement of how proud I am of our musicians, those who choose the hymns. Today's hymn after the sermon works perfectly with what I'm preaching about, which is the cross, the theology of the cross, the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of God's love for the whole world. I'm just saying that because I was so moved as I was writing the sermon and going back and forth to that hymn. Hymns bring out sermons all by themselves, and they do a beautiful job. I'm also proud of all of you, and just want to make you realize that and say it again as an encourager to this marvelous congregation. But I'm not preaching on the gospel lesson today, but on the second lesson. The wisdom of God is better than the wisdom of people. In fact, what looks like foolishness to the human nature is actually wisdom. It's the upside-down world that Jesus lived, taught, proclaimed, died in, and was raised up again in. And the reality is that the cross is, as St. Paul says in the second lesson, a true stumbling block for all of us. I love what uh, the great poet uh, W.H. Auden says in his poem, uh, about Compline, the, the uh, daily offices of prayer. And at the last office of prayer, he has this poem that, as only poetry can do, describes the cross and the work of Christ in his death as a holy mystery beyond all knowing and liking even. Because there's something about the cross that human nature doesn't like. We're death to nine, for one thing. We like the glorious things of life. We don't really go after death. But the reality is the Christian life is all about death and resurrection, just like nature is. It's all about dying to something old and rising to something new, and it's happening in your life daily. Death to avarice, life to generosity. Death to selfishness, new life to embracing everyone. It's death and resurrection. We're not told to get better in the Bible. Nobody gets better. It's death and resurrection, all in the hands of this merciful, loving, and mysterious God. And we can't fully explain it, but we know at some level that its wisdom is stronger than the wisdom of this world. So I'm just going to go back there and read that. The message of the cross, the first verse in our second lesson, is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, made whole. It is the power of God. There is a power in the cross. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Who is the one who was wise? Where is the scribe? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? And I'm going to contrast those in this sermon. For Jews demand signs, as you heard. Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim, what? Christ crucified, a stumbling block. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than our human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. All right. Some of you were at the first forum I did back in October where I talked about the, excuse me, with your permission, Asinari, a Greek word that means uh, bearing the head of an ass or a donkey. And it is the first portrait, some of you were there, we have of Jesus. And it's not oil painting. It's scratched into the barracks of a wall that someone found in 1857. And uh, it is graffiti picture of Jesus. It's a cartoon. And it has a man, and I have these in the back because I know I can anticipate you guys. You're going to say, I want to see that picture. And you have it. The ushers, the smiling men back there are so gracious, and they have some copies. They'll make more copies. Alexa Menas, it says, worships his God. And what does the picture look like? Alexa Menas is a short little Roman soldier looking up to the cross. It's a Tau cross, a T cross with the body of Jesus outstretched. You can see the nail prints in the hand in this sketch. And the head of an ass. Because why? The cross is 
foolishness to that Roman soldier who was brought up in empire thinking that how, how do you become wise? By getting ahead, by following the emperor, by killing your enemies, by not paying attention to these lowly people over here besides they're sick, they're lame, they're crippled, probably getting what they deserve from a god of wrath. That's human wisdom. And it's always been human wisdom. From day one in the recorded history, people who think about God, think about having to do something, manipulate something, have some sort of transaction that they can get God to like them, maybe love them, and certainly give them things that they want. You know, throwing salt over your left shoulder, (laughs) cutting off the head of a chicken and putting it in a certain place. We do these things because we think that's what God really wants. Um, It gets more sophisticated. Uh, Following the Ten Commandments perfectly. Uh, That's another chicken head. Salt over your shoulder. Um, Then God will really like me. I mean, I've got to do something first because that's what life is like in the real world, in our daily work. You do something good, you get accolades, and you get benefits. And the problem is, and I've said this before, The problem is we translate what happens in everyday life in an economic system like the capitalist system, uh, I mean, I'm not putting that down, but that's the way we live, and we transfer that to our understanding of God, that we have to produce, and then God will be very happy with us and love us and spare us from hell and all this stuff. All right. So here's this picture, uh, and... uh, they found it, they believed that it was scratched in there, and there's other graffiti scratched in there. I mean, it's just like the railroad cars today, you know, people, or on bridges. They're making a statement. And the Roman soldiers, some of them might have been there at the cross when this soldier, whoever it was, scratched in this picture of Jesus with a head of an ass. Foolishness. Everybody knew back then that anyone who dies on a cross is a traitor, a criminal, uh, a slave that ran away, or somebody that the emperor just didn't like. And how do you get rid of your problems if you're the emperor? You chop off their head or you crucify them publicly to let everybody know this ain't the way to live. Dying for the sake of other people an ignoble ignoble death on a cross where the ravens afterwards would come and eat the body that was left? Foolishness. There's nothing glorious about that, and people like the glorious stuff, the powerful stuff. You know, I have friends, I think I still have them. (laughs) When they talk about God, it's it's the cataclysmic things. I was, I was sleeping in bed and there was a great thunderstorm and I saw the glory of God. Okay, well, does it always have to be that way? Even some of the prophets said, stop saying that. God is not found in the whirlwind or the hurricane or the storm, but God is found where? In the still, small voice, which seems for all the world to be weakness. We like commanders that, especially men commanders with all kinds of muscles, that are shouting things from the microphone. I don't know if you know anyone like that. That's what we like. That's wisdom. Wisdom is getting ahead of your neighbor, doing something that maybe you need to step on your neighbor's fingers on the ladder towards status and wealth. That's, that's human wisdom, see? And that's what St. Paul takes to task so brilliantly, not just in this passage, which is the clearest one, but in other places in the New Testament. And Jesus did the same thing when he took to task some of that human wisdom from the Old Testament and said, nay, no, and nigh. That is not not God's wisdom. That's human wisdom. All right, um, Luther on the theology of the cross. All the wisdom of the world is childish foolishness in comparison with the wisdom of Christ. For what is more wonderful than the unspeakable mystery that the Son of God, the image of the Eternal, took upon him our very nature? And in the cross, that holy mystery that Auden says is beyond all knowing and liking. In that holy mystery, he took our sorrows, our pain, 
our sins and uncertainties and gave us instead his grace, his faithfulness, his joy. People couldn't make up this kind of wisdom because we're in a different mindset, see? And that's why I said a couple Sundays ago, repentance means go beyond the mindset you have, metanoia, beyond the mind you have into the wisdom God has planned for the whole world, see? Jesus from the cross did something, and for those who, as Paul says, are being whole by it, we understand it as goodness. He forgave his executioners. Can you imagine being one of the Roman soldiers brought up in the entirely different mindset and listening to him forgiving someone who just was making him bleed and die? Foolishness, they must have said. Look at that idiot. Even in his death, he's doing this love thing. (laughs) That's not wisdom. Wisdom is getting what? Revenge. But God is not in the revenge system. God would rather die than demand that we die. And that's the whole mystery, which is beyond knowing and liking, in the cross. Is that God hangs there. Jesus, second person of the Trinity. That's God. In the flesh. Luther said it this way, the wisdom of God is found in the things that are hidden, like coming to a 16-year-old teenager, we think Mary was 16, around that age, and saying, you're going to be mother of God, of Christ. It seems foolish. Why didn't, why didn't the angel come to some royal person with lots of money and status who could wear gold rings and say, look who I am? It's foolishness. And then the foolishness of the cross is the final symbol of God's wisdom, opposed to our wisdom. Very, very different. All right, so here's what happens with the foolishness, which is really wisdom of God. In the parables Jesus tells, there's a story of a young man, I don't know if you remember it, he had a brother, the brother was Mr. Goody Two Shoes, and the younger one went out and spent all the money on whores and whiskey and wine and women and all kinds of stuff. And what does the father do when he, daily he goes to the end of the path, he looks with tears in his eyes for his son who was lost? You know what the law said? If a young man discredit his father because it was all about shame and honor. When that young man comes back, you have the whole town come out and you stone him to death. That's right. Show them that that's not honorable to uh, screw up your dad's income by taking it early, which is in effect the young man was saying, I hope you're dead, dad. That's what he's saying. The community could have killed him. But in the parable, Jesus says, oh no, that's the wisdom of Human beings, that's the wisdom of the world. But let me tell you about God's wisdom. This father says, come to me, son. And the son starts to make excuses. He said, I want you to shut up. Just come. Get into my arms. I love you. I've missed you. Throw a party. And of course, what does the other son do? Gets his nose hugely out of joint because he's done all the good things. He's cut off the chicken head. He's thrown the salt over his shoulder. He's worked hard, and there's no party for him. The father has to say, get over yourself. This brother of yours was lost. You've been here all along. Now he is found. You see the difference in the wisdom? And how does it work in everyday life? Now I can walk out here. You know what I'm going to do. Because stories are the best way to share this stuff. Uh, A few years ago, down in Arkansas, middle of Arkansas, very remote area, uh, four men, convicts, broke out of prison. And once they were out, they went separate ways. I guess that's how you do it. (laughs) You don't want to be in a group. And Riley Arsena, who had killed a person, uh, was wielding a sawed-off Shotgun, 12-gauge, huge. And uh, Louise and Nathan de Graffenried, an older couple, lived on a little farm in a beautiful little spot with hills surrounding them. They loved the Lord. They were Christian. They loved life. And suddenly, out of nowhere, they hear this shouting outside their door. And they open the door, and here is Riley Arsena pointing the gun at him, at them, and saying, don't make me kill you. (laughs) 
and here's where it gets good. Louise, without flinching, walks towards him and says, put that gun down, young man. We are Christian. Jesus doesn't allow violence, and I don't allow violence in this house. Put it down. And you know what he does? He puts it down. And she says, you look really tired and dirty, and you look like you're in trouble. Come on in. Nathan, start the breakfast. Nathan runs around, gets the eggs, the bacon, the toast, the coffee. And Riley Arsenal is trembling. Louise comes over the table and takes his hand and says, Young man, you are troubled. Jesus really loves you the most right now. She says, I want to have a prayer for you. She has a prayer. And she turns to Riley and she says, Would you like to have a prayer and ask for anything? And he, he says nothing. She says, Okay, just say Jesus wept. <laughs> and and he, he said it. Jesus wept. She said, Afterwards, they asked him, they asked Louise, why did you pick those two words? She said, well, I figure he wasn't a churchgoer, and that's the shortest Bible passage there is. We want to start out slow. (laughs) (laughs) Wisdom of humans or wisdom of God? The wisdom of God is about salvation, redemption, reconciliation, transformation. And uh, they're eating breakfast, and he doesn't say much, so... uh, Louise sings a couple of hymns, ones that you know. Jesus loves the little children, among others. All this love stuff, you see, to a man who, let's just face it, think about it, has got to be so troubled, so sad, so angry. Hurt and anger are twins, see. And then they hear the police. The police arrive. Several cars, as you can imagine, sirens going, and they come out with their guns drawn. I wonder if anybody knows here how Louise handled the cops. (laughs) That's right. I'll tell you. She walks right out like she did to uh, Riley, Arsena, and she says, all right, put those guns down right now, and I mean it. This is a Christian home. Jesus doesn't believe in violence, and we don't believe in violence. Put them down. Did you know what the police did? They put them back in their holster. <laughs> and she says, are you as hungry as Riley Arsena? Yeah, he's in here. I know who you're looking for. Would you like breakfast as well? And I sit around the table. No guns. Uh, Louise had taken the shotgun and stuck it under the bed in another room where Riley couldn't get it. See? Now, Riley's really trembling, and she's got them all there, and she says, now, we're going to do this the Christian way. Riley, you're in some trouble, and the law is here, but no one's going to get killed. No one's going to get hurt. And they took him. He, he became really calm. He looked at her and began to cry, gave her a hug, and she said, this is only the beginning. Yeah, they're taking you to prison, and Nathan and I will visit you and remind you of God's love. Now, I tell you that story because many people might think, they could have lost their lives. Yes, but they didn't. And for my money, I think that because love was the overpowering thing that it is, it's not just a word, it's a power, I think Christ, through the Spirit, worked in all of those men's lives And something good came out of it. This is the wisdom of God. It's not getting ahead. It's not getting love for just you and your own, your kin, your family, if you're really um, generous, your community and maybe your state and country. We don't get to the world very often in our human wisdom. But in God's wisdom, shalom happens. Peace and justice. Love for all. Everyone's welcome. It doesn't matter if your friends have a bat and ball or a beach ball. It doesn't matter what color their clothes are, what color their skin is, nothing. God loves the whole creation. As St. Augustine says, and I make him say it very often because I love it. God knows what God wants, God makes what God wants, and God loves what, what what, what God wanted. All of it. Not just some, but all of it, including Riley Arsena. Yesterday is gone, tomorrow is not yet come. Live into the wisdom 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.